Welcome to this Episcopal Lecture Series. I'm really excited to be uh, part of, of this, so I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, Jekyllie Singh and Ben Ong have to, to contribute to this uh, theme of hospitality. I'm going to begin tonight by uh, opening up the series and opening up the theme uh, thinking about the hospitality of God and how God's hospitality is central to our understanding of uh, salvation history and our understanding of our relationship with God. Uh, this icon is very familiar uh, to us all by uh, Andrei Rublev uh, in 1411. and He produced it for the abbot of the Trinity Monastery in, in Russia. We often think of it as a, an icon of the Holy Trinity. Its name is actually the Hospitality of Abraham. Uh, many people, uh, like today, uh, were in Rublev's time confused about the doctrine of the Trinity. Some rejected it altogether. Rublev's icon shows a lovely understanding of God as three in one. That's beyond trying to figure it out. There's that wonderful saying of Augustine of Hippo, that if you have understood, then what you've understood is not God. In other words, to try and give expression to, to try and describe the nature of God, God as Holy Trinity is beyond our words and beyond our comprehension, beyond, therefore, our explanation. Well, you remember that in the book of Genesis, uh, there's a story of three men who visited Abraham in the form of angels, representing God. In Rublev's icon, he depicts the three heavenly figures sitting at a table with a cup placed before them on the table. Behind them is the oak tree of Mamre. From left to right, the figures are Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're equal in size, and each one holds a rod in his left hand, symbolising their equality. Each wears a cloak of blue, symbolising their divinity. And the face of each is exactly the same, depicting their oneness. The Father's blue cloak is itself cloaked in a colour that is light and almost transparent because God is, the God the Father is the hidden creator. With his right hand, he blesses the Son, and his gaze is turned to the other two figures. The Son is the middle figure. He wears the blue of divinity and reddish purple of royal priesthood. Christ was given a purple cloak on the Friday he was crucified. He's the servant king whose throne is a cross. With his hand, he blesses the cup of suffering he's about to drink. His head is bowed in submission to the Father. The Holy Spirit wears a cloak of green, symbolising life and regeneration. His hand is resting on the table next to the cup, suggesting that he will be with the Son as he carries out his mission. His head is inclined to the Father and to the Son. And if you look at each of the faces, you notice a circular pattern with each one gazing at the other. Love is initiated by the Father, embodied by the Son, and accomplished through the Spirit. This wonderful meditation by Henri Nouan, a meditation on this icon. Nouan says, The more we look at this holy image with the eyes of faith, the more we come to realise that it is painted not as a lovely decoration for a convent church, nor as a helpful explanation of a difficult doctrine, but as a holy place to enter and to stay within. And as we place ourselves in the front of the icon in prayer, do you see the space in the icon there to welcome you in, drawing you in? We come to experience a gentle invitation to participate in the intimate conversation that's taking place. The movement from the Father toward the Son and the movement of both Son and Spirit toward the Father become a movement in which the one who prays is lifted up and held secure. So we come to see with our inner eyes that all engagements in this world can bear fruit only when they take place within this divine circle, the house of perfect love. Praying to the Lord before Rublev's icon can help us to join Abraham in hosting the Lord in our hearts. 
As we do, we discover that the Father, Son and Spirit were already inviting us to join in their circle of love. We love because he first loved us. When we participate in the hospitality of Abraham, we discover that really we're responding to the hospitality of the Trinity. Isn't that a wonderful image in Abraham offering hospitality to these three angels, these three strangers representing God? Here's humankind offering hospitality to God, the creator of all, the redeemer of all, the sustainer of all. Now there are some other images, aren't there, that speak of God's hospitality and our awareness of God in uh, and through hospitality. One of my favourites is the story of the two disciples walking towards Emmaus, joined by the stranger. And it's in the breaking of the bread that they knew him. Hospitality can reveal the very character of God. Or we can think of the feeding of the 5,000. There is enough when we share. Remember the famous saying of Mahatma Gandhi, there's enough in this world for each person's need, but not for each person's greed. There is enough when we share, the miracle of sharing. Perhaps we can think of the Good Samaritan. Now when we think of the word hospitality or the variation hospitable, it's used only a handful of times in the Bible. But if you look at the roots of this compound word, then we find depth and life to our understanding. When used in the New Testament, it appears as philoxenia or philoxenox. Philos, the first part of these New Testament occurrences of the word hospitality, is understood to mean fondness or friendliness and love. Xenos, the second part of this word, is understood to refer to an alien, guest or stranger. Philoxenia, philoxenos, when combined, they're used to describe the act of entertaining guests or strangers or somebody who is given to hospitality or simply a lover of strangers, the Good Samaritan. Now, the next image uh, that I think of when I think of the hospitality of God is the woman at the well. Remember the story in the fourth chapter of John. We have a picture of Jesus showing mercy to a woman who obviously needed it. I say obviously because we actually have the full story, don't we, in John's Gospel. Several things stand out about the story and help illustrate the mercy of hospitality. First, she was a woman, and not only a woman, but a Samaritan woman. In that day, it was completely inappropriate to be alone with a woman unless she was your spouse or a member of your family. Many would have balked at the idea of Jesus spending time with her because of that fact alone. Not only did he speak with her, but he asked her for a drink. And couple that with the fact that she was a Samaritan, and now you have a controversy. Jesus, in an act of hospitality, steps over cultural norms, boundaries and expectations to bring the truth of himself to this woman. Now I find it really interesting that she was the first person in his ministry to whom he revealed his true identity. Now next, Jesus offers her a drink of the best spring water in the universe. He begins here to allude to his identity by offering her eternal life. Here we have a Jew, somebody who normally would have nothing to do with a Samaritan, treating her with kindness and offering to quench her thirst eternally. She's already been caught off guard, but he continues to surprise her. Jesus is gentle when he points out the details of her life. And when she asks for the water he's offering, he responds by telling her to go and get her husband. Apparently, he had enough insight from the father to know that she didn't have a husband. Not only did she not have a husband, but she had also already had five previous husbands and was living with a man who was not her husband. Jesus could have said to her, you are an adulterer who couldn't keep a relationship if your life depended on it. Your lifestyle is offensive to God. I can't serve you a glass of this eternal spring water. What will others, others think about my beliefs and about my father? Instead, he gave her a word of knowledge, if you will, which served as an incredibly hospitable act and a catalyst for her saving faith. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one 
who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Finally, the result of this hospitality was a changed life and the opportunity to share the good news of the kingdom. She runs back, she gathers the whole town. This man knew everything about her. That must have been intriguing to the townspeople. It was certainly intriguing to his own disciples who wondered why he was even speaking to her. The hospitality of God. Now, there's that lovely verse in John's Gospel in chapter 21. Jesus came took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. That picture of Jesus post-resurrection on the beach, lighting a charcoal fire and cooking food for his disciples. A simple beachfront meal. Now so time begins running backwards, and the curse of sin, shame and death starts coming undone. Remember how at the beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve feel their nakedness as something shameful, and so hide themselves from God. Their fellowship with God, broken by sin and shame, they end up outside the gates to paradise where an angel with a flaming sword prohibits anyone's return. But at the end of John's Gospel, Peter goes from trying to hide his nakedness and shame to sharing food and fellowship with Jesus around a lakeside charcoal grill. That's the great reversal that Christ has accomplished. In fact, all the disciples sharing bread and grilled fish with Jesus around that fire were candidates for shame and estrangement from God. For all of them had failed and fled Jesus in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And still, Jesus invites them for a beachfront breakfast, serves them, those who had failed to serve him. Now that's good news for all of us who are drawn to Jesus and what he has to offer but who know, that niggling, who know that niggling, nagging fear that something about ourselves might make us unwelcome and unworthy to share food and fellowship with him. But in Jesus' beachfront breakfast, we see a picture of God as host, even as a gracious host who gives his misbehaving, unreliable guests second chances. He is even a host who sees through our fig leaves and our other attempts to cover up our nakedness you know, to appear more respectable and presentable, like Peter jumping into the water and who still invites us in to dine with him. Jesus doesn't affirm nor bless nor approve of all that his guests have done or failed to do. Immediately following his beachside breakfast, Jesus would deal with Peter's previous threefold denial of ever having known him, but he would do so graciously, redemptively, with an invitation to say, Yes, Lord, I love you, for every one of the three times that Peter had denied him. And so our heavenly host affirms, approves, and blesses all people, if not all things. His is a table to which all can come as they are, but from which no one should expect to leave as they were. So this really short gospel passage is an example of the fact that if we can read the gospels without getting hungry, then we're really not paying attention. There's a lot of food and hospitality being shared throughout his ministry. And hospitality is also a rich theme throughout all of the Bible. It begins with God as the ultimate host, who creates a universe in which to host his human guests. So whenever something in nature touches us to the depths of our heart in ways deeper than words, so that all creation seems to be saying, don't look at me, but look through me to the one who made us, that may, may be God's way of saying, welcome, welcome my child through his creation. To say, I made all this for you, to shelter you, nurture you, delight you and inspire you. You're always welcome here, make yourself at home. In the Bible, God's hospitality is further focused in the Garden of Eden, where God hosts Adam and Eve. Later, God hosts Israel in Canaan, the Promised Land. The arc of the Bible story leads to an invitation to the greatest feast of all. In Isaiah 25, God's coming victory over death is compared to a feast set by a gracious host. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, a rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheep that is spread over all nations. 
he will swallow up death forever. This coming victory feast is called in John's revelation the wedding feast of the Lamb, to which people from all corners of the map are invited. Come, you blessed of my Father, Jesus says in a parable about this feast. The Bible ends with God bringing down from heaven a city, the new Jerusalem, where he'll host a redeemed and ransomed humanity forever. The very last command given in the Bible takes the form of a host's invitation. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of water of life. The Bible, then, is a book about hospitality, beginning and ending with God's hospitality to us. In between creation and our recreation, God continues to host and feed us through his word, the gospel and the scriptures. We begin with God's hospitality to us because all human hospitality begins with God's hospitality. We can only pass on what love and welcome we have let God show us. We love because God first loved us. So it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that in the Bible, hospitality is much more than knowing how to cook a gourmet meal, how to set a table nicely for guests, and how to keep a friendly, comfortable atmosphere going with pleasant and polite conversation. Uh, as great and as important as such skills are, in the Bible, hospitality is a matter of life and death. Because nomads and sojourners like Abraham and Sarah hadn't a motel to stop in, they didn't have a convenient McDonald's at every exit on the road, they had to depend on the hospitality of others. You took your life into your hands whenever you presented yourself at a stranger's home or at their tent seeking food and shelter for the night. The only thing riskier was to sleep outside where wild beasts and bandits might find you. You were also risking your life by hosting and feeding the strangers who appeared at your door. Yet if word got around the trade and travel routes that you were stingy and unhospitable to strangers, your honour tanked in the eyes of those who help you. But if you were known to be gracious, generous hosts, or that you had proven yourself to be grateful, respectful and restrained guests, that would also become known and all the greater would be your honour, your security and your resources in your times of need. They had also made of hospitality in the ancient biblical world a way of life, even a way of being, so Henri Nguyen, in his book Reaching Out, defined hospitality as more than a skill set, but rather a fundamental attitude toward our fellow human being, which can be expressed in a great variety of ways. Sharing food and a table is not the only way of showing hospitality, nor always the best way. One of the most important ways Nuon talks about is that you show hospitality by listening. When our ears are directly connected to our hearts and we make both our hearts and our ears available to someone with a sacrifice of time, concentration and a suspension of our own agenda to advise, to fix, to change, heal or convert them, then there is hospitality even if no food or coffee are shared. Because as well as we all need advice, fixing, healing, changing and converting continually, the only thing that truly enlightens, fixes, heals, changes and converts us is a love so great that we know it doesn't need uh, to enlighten, fix, heal, change or convert. Now for us to accept the enlightenment, healing, fixing, changing and converting that we all and always need. We have to feel secure enough. We have to know that we are known and that we're loved already in our current confused and conflicted stages. That's the way God hosts us and that's the way God feeds us, heals us, helps us. Not when we're worthy enough and lovable enough to deserve the divine hospitality but precisely when we are the most unworthy, the most in need of love and hospitality. And the word for such undeserved transforming love is grace. Hospitality then is a kind of presence, availability and receptivity towards others that's willing to love them apart from any questions of worthiness, apart from any consideration of whether we agree, approve or even understand everything they do, say or want. That again is the way that God loves and hosts us. 
Now just think of the challenges that the church faces in every age. Think of the challenges the church has faced in our own time. And think again about what this radical hospitality expects of us. It's not when we are already lovable. It's not when uh, we are already worthy. Rather, it's in our unlovable state, our unworthy state, that God meets us and transforms us. So hospitality is scary and risky. We've all experienced people taking advantage of our time, our friendship, our care, our stuff. Again, so it is with God and with God's hospitality to us. The cross was the ultimate risk and the ultimate cost to God. The ultimate cost of God's hospitality towards us. Still, hospitality is a two-way street of respect between guest and host. So God's gracious hospitality comes with boundaries and obligations for his guests. Just as we would not sneak uninvited into our host's bedroom or closet during a dinner party or raid their refrigerator, although truth be told I have done that. So in Eden's garden, Adam and Eve were never to eat from the tree of life, but they did. And now their children are trashing God's beautiful planet. In Canaan, God's Hebrew guests were to worship no other gods but him, and they were to treat each other justly. But when instead they filled his city with the blood of the innocent and his temple with the idols of their neighbours, God's glory left the temple and took his protective power eastward to Babylon, there to await his guests in the land of exile. Similar boundaries and conditions apply to us as guests in the kingdom of God. We must not try to replace the master of the house with other gods or idols, and we must treat each other with honour, care and compassion. Should we forget that hospitality also implies res respect, restraint, sacrifice, honour, boundaries and obligations for us guests, as well as for the host, God does not suspend the laws of consequence. We will thereby place ourselves outside the gates. But God never locks the door against a prodigal son's repentant return either. The lights remain on, the table is still set, the door is unlocked, and the food warm on the stove for anyone who will return. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said that loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible poverty. It's a poverty common to us all, whatever our income. A New York Times article highlighted a growing crisis of loneliness and isolation despite all the ways that we're connected by mass media, social media, cell phones, email, internet and more. Or maybe because of them, we're losing the art and the practice of true physical face time. Professionals in the field of mental and physical health are calling this rising tide of loneliness an epidemic. Today there are over 7 billion lonely, vulnerable, at-risk people in this world, including ourselves who need, at the very least, the shelter of a smile and the coldness of this world's dark night. But if we are to offer such hospitality in the name of God, we must accept it, believe it, and receive it as God says to us, through his world, through his word, and through his church. Welcome, my child, whoever you are. Make yourself at home with me forever. This beautiful meditation by the Reverend Mandy Carr, who is the vicar of a country church in Weld in Seven Oaks in Kent in the United Kingdom, reflects deeply on Rublev's icon, uh, the hospitality of, of Abraham. Remember those three strangers, those three angels, representing God. And Abraham offers them hospitality. An icon which, uh, for many of us, has helped us into an understanding and an appreciation of the Trinity gathering us in uh, at the table. They sit and they wait. There's room for me at the table, 
that they'll not force me to come. Theirs is an invitation, not coercion. They are the community of God, the three in one, the divine unity in Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They are the circle of love. They show us what love looks like and what love feels like because their very essence is love. I tie myself up in metaphysical knots trying to understand, but freedom is not found there. The truth lies beyond my conscious understanding. It exists in a deep knowing that transcends words and thoughts. It's intuitive, threaded through the fibre of my being. It's the divine spark within, resonating with the call of the Creator. Beloved, come, take your place, eat and drink with us. I want to, but I'm fearful. I know I'm not worthy. I know what goes on behind closed doors. I know the dirt that soils my soul, the pride, the vanity, the selfishness, all that distorts the original image within. How can I take that place? It's not my place. It must be for someone else, someone who does not think and feel and act as I do. I am filthy in their presence and the grime has seeped into every pore in my body. I sweat dirt and don't want to sully their table. I can barely lift my eyes to them, but I can tell that they're looking at me. In a brief brave moment I dare to raise my eyes and meet the same loving gaze from each of them, in the same face full of light. At that moment I'm undone, a searing sword pierces my heart, it slices through my pretense. I'm left naked and vulnerable, knowing without a shadow of a doubt that they know, they've seen, and that nothing is hidden. They know how much I've missed the mark. They know the deep chasm between what I profess to the world and what I am. Under their glorious light, I am transparent. Their holiness lightens even the deepest darkness until it all is illuminated. I'm in danger of being crushed by my shame. I want to run away and hide to block out this fierce knowing so I can hold on to some semblance of disguise. And they keep their gaze on me and call me again. Come now. Come now, beloved. Drink deeply of the wine of the kingdom. It's for you. How is this? They see me as I am with all my faults and failings and they still offer me the wine of the kingdom. They still want me at their table. They look at me through eyes of love, not condemnation. They still call me their beloved, even when they know a life of love is far from what I live. I want to respond, but I'm still reticent. I'm shackled to a graceless life that depends on competition or on a place allocated by circumstances and birth. It's a place where seats at the banquet are reserved for the best and most important and where others are rejected and thrown outside the city gates. I do not have the right. The honour of the place is not mine. Their holy presence prompts the sudden realisation that the question of rights is irrelevant. I can't earn my place or deserve it because it's already given to me in love and grace. There is no qualification. It's not doctrine, ritual, religion or even faith that draws me in. It's their love. It's their love alone that invites me to take my place or walk away. I have to decide whether I, like the Israelites in the desert looking at the bronze serpent lifted high, will raise my eyes to receive my healing, or whether I will die from the poison in my soul. There's always a choice because love does not force itself. Here is the opportunity to step outside of time and be absorbed into the now of eternity, life in all its fullness beginning at this moment. There are so many questions. But the answers are shrouded in mystery and paradox, out of reach and yet closer than my own breath. Eternal life can be mine and it can start now if only I have the courage to accept their hospitality. What would it mean to sit down with the three in one? What would it feel like to be part of that circle of love? I know I would not remain the same. How could I? 
that love changes us. And what would it feel like to have the divine life cursing through my veins? What would it be like to share the mystical union of being in Christ, of being one with the Father, being filled with the Holy Spirit? Surely it would be like being born again. I'd see with new eyes and love with their love, living in peace and joy within their light. Overwhelmed by their perfect love, I would learn what it means to be in communion. Being with God rather than doing for God. It would be living in a place of such harmony, peace and affection that it stills all thought and anxiety. The mutual indwelling bringing a sense of completion. Falsehood would drop away and security would be dissolved and in its place the assurance of sins forgiven, hurts healed and identity conferred. I'm called to the table in the kingdom to eat and drink and be born again by the Spirit, accepting who I am through God's eyes. I'm called to lay down my fears and objections, to allow them to clothe me with my true self and not to cling to the filthy rags the world has given me. I'm to trust that all things are possible, not because of what I've done, but because of the love that has enfolded me all my life, even if I haven't been aware of it. It's a love magnificently through the cross and empty tomb. A love available to all of God's beloved creation. I will sit down with the three in one. How can I not, when I have glimpsed what it may bring? As I share with them the feast set before me, I find myself saying those old familiar words. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse us and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Let the transformation by eternal, by eternal love begin. Amen.